Uh, thank you very much, Paula. But I've heard a lot of those stories. And we heard a, a stories from, a, oh, must have been a thousand people across the country. And they weren't all as bad as that, but they were similar. So that's why I'm here today. Now you perhaps ought to know something about me, because uh, Julia Cumberbatch sends her regards, by the way, I spoke to her over the weekend. Uh, I'm a retired paediatrician. Um, I was dean of a medical school. I was chairman of the Standards Committee of the General Medical Council. All of that was in the last century. Uh, this century, I've been a patient. And I think I might have been a better doctor if I'd been a patient before. Uh, but I've benefited hugely from medical innovation. I'm a, I qualified in 1963. And with the knowledge of medicine that existed in 1963, half the people of my age now, I'm in my 80s, would not now be alive. And I'm one of them, because I've had two new heart valves, and the last one uh, was put in uh, through the femoral artery and pushed into my heart. That's an amazing innovation. And uh, without innovation, we would not make the advances. So there used to be a saying in Victorian times that a good doctor was better than a bad doctor, and almost as good as no doctor at all. And that was largely true. It's no longer true uh, because of medical innovation. But that doesn't in any way justify the pain and the suffering that people have experienced. And so to us it was a remarkable experience over two years, between 2018 and 2020, to go around the country and meet people who, who have been damaged uh, the philosopher Honor O'Neill says a good, uh, that doctors have to be trusted, but to be trusted, you have to be trustworthy. That means that you've got to be competent, reliable, and honest. And I like to think that most doctors are, but there's some that are not. And uh, we've got to find ways of reducing damage to an absolute minimum. Now, I don't have the answers. I do have some questions, and we have some experience, which we can all share today. But I really do congratulate uh, the people here for organizing today to search out the answers to the questions. And uh, after a while, uh, women who have taken it were worried that some uh, abnormalities had occurred in their babies and thought the primidos might be uh, the cause of it. That is still a moot point through the legal system. But what is absolutely clear to us was that it should not have been continued on the market uh, after 1967, but it was. And certainly there are nearly a thousand women in our society who feel very let down and have suffered because of that. The next intervention was sodium valproate. Sodium valproate is a medicine, an anti-epileptic medicine, uh, given for very difficult cases of epilepsy, but it undoubtedly causes damage to babies. And uh, what was not realized was just how many babies. In 1972, it was introduced by the 1980s, it appeared with something called fetal valproate syndrome. And more recently, it's been shown to cause autism and developmental delay. And there are probably 20,000 women who have been affected. And it's still called this damage today. Uh, much less than it was, uh, it's proving very difficult to stop women taking it. Some people, of course, can't stop taking it because they're epilepsy, it would be dangerous to do that. But we're still on the case, and uh, every woman taken has been written to, and the MLRHA uh, are working very hard and listen very well. Um, we're great to the MHRA and the new director, Dr. Julie Ray, will be the work she's done since our review to try and improve uh, uh, the way we manage these things. And finally, of course, there's polypropylene mesh. And uh, Paul is right, we were asked to concentrate on vaginal mesh, but I'm well aware of rectopexy and the problems that it causes. And certainly, I think it's a much better system now 
for reviewing those operations through multidisciplinary teams and specialist centers and so forth. But we're not there yet. But uh, I have also not no doubt at all about the damage that that has caused too. So we met the families. It's the first thing we did, and we went around the country to over 20 centres. We went to Wales, uh, although we uh, and we went to Scotland, although we weren't responsible for Scotland. But <coughs> what I want to just draw your attention to is the last one. You know, the healthcare system fails to acknowledge when things go wrong. It, blame, it fears blame and litigation. And that is a, a big problem, which I'll come to later on. But, uh, Jeremy Hunt recently published a book called Zero, in which he points out there are 150 avoidable deaths each year in our country, uh, in the National Health Service. This isn't because the NHS is a bad health care system, quite the reverse. It happens all over the world. It was drawn to attention in 1999 by the Institute of Medicine in the United States that pointed out it was called to err as human. And it pointed out how many avoidable errors, well, not errors, but things going wrong in medicine. And the trouble is that the only way you can get compensation in our country is to sue. And litigation uh, takes a long time, costs a lot of money, and it involves blame, and you do not improve things that way. The gas industry, the electricity, the building industry, the air traffic industry have all shown that the way to improve is to learn, to find out what went wrong. Was it avoidable? And how can we make sure it doesn't happen again? So there were nine recommendations, as Paul has said. Um, if only you get involved in these reviews, uh, don't have more than nine recommendations. Um, we do make some other suggestions in the report, but nine is as many as you can get. The first one's easy, we got that it's the same day. We got an apology, and quite rightly so, but the others have not been so easy. The next is the, the Patient Safety Commission. Uh, well, this was an important one, and I'm glad to say it has been accepted, largely because uh, Baroness Cumberbatch managed to get it into a bill that happened to be going through Parliament, and uh, Henrietta Hughes, Henrietta Hughes has just been appointed to this post. Now, why, why do we need patient safety commission? Well, the, the reason must be obvious to all of you, because you don't need to have a statutory inquiry like us to find out what's going on. You need somebody that you could, patients can go to, other than their politicians and years of campaigning, to get some to draw attention in the system that there's something wrong, something is happening uh, and damage seems to be occurring, we need to understand if it is, why it is, and what it is. We have lots of complaint systems, but they don't come to a single point, point, point of call. And so the Patient Safety Commissioner is there to listen, to learn, to work across the system, to monitor trends, and to ensure action is taken without having to have a national inquiry. So we have our Patient Safety Commissioner, and we look forward to what she achieves. The third one was a redress agency, and that takes me back to the question of blame. Other countries manage this differently. Some of them don't, some of them just like us, that you have to go to law and sue and uh, prove clinical negligence in order to get uh, uh, compensation and to effect change. But other countries don't do that. They ask the question, not who's to blame, but was it avoidable? And if it was avoidable, how can we look after the people who have been damaged? Uh, think of vaccine damage from COVID. We all know, we don't all know, many of us think that vaccination is a very good idea, but occasionally damage has occurred. We shouldn't have to sue, and you don't have to sue. Um, and that we've learned that it was avoidable. It's uh, the effective blood inquiry that's going on at the moment, but there are many examples of this. And I just want to take a diversion briefly to talk about maternity. So the Redress Agency is a new way to evolve, to uh, resolve disputes. It's based on the notion of being avoidable, and it looks after the families immediately. It learns the lesson across the, uh, the, the health system, and it's an independent system. So maternity. 
And the reason I go to maternity is that uh, Julian and I have done another review in the last decade, and that was on better births, and it's about maternity. And, uh, and of course, it's all in the news again through the Ottoman report. We probably don't realize that, that, that we, it's costing one billion pounds a year now to support 100 to 130 families who have babies who have been tragically, seriously damaged during birth. This adds out of nearly 700,000 births a year. Childbirth in this country is safe. Uh, it's, but it's not as safe as it could be, both in terms of maternal mortality, which is very really rare, it occurs, and in baby damage. This billion pounds a year is half the cost of uh, the outcome of uh, compensation litigation that the NHS has to pay. But the sums that are logged in each year are much larger than that. So each year, they're now logging uh, NHS resolution about five billion pounds of potential claims, and half of them are related to maternity. Well, that used to be the case in Sweden. And in Sweden, uh, in about 2006, uh, they introduced a new system. They said, not who's to blame, but was it avoidable? So they have an independent investigation that goes in, uh, talks to the families, that's very, very important, talks to the clinical team, learns, why it's happened, what has happened, and was it avoidable? This is not, by the way, an alternative to litigation. If people are dissatisfied, they, they have rights in law, and they can always litigate the village. In Sweden, they rarely do. They find out quickly what went wrong. They work with the teams to make sure it doesn't happen again. They look after the families. And the result has been a steady decline in damage. And Sweden is now uh, twice as safe as we are. You're going to get copies of all these slides, so don't bother to read this one. Which we've got to find in. And interestingly enough, um, they do actually have lower cesarean section rates and induction rates, and it's been associated with a reduction in health for injuries during the birth. And so that takes me back to the first do no harm and the medicines review. So that was um, uh, our third recommendation. The fourth was financial assistance. <clears throat> this is not compensation, but these families are suffering. They're suffering in all, uh, the prima dots, I've mentioned, a thousand women who uh, have been suffering. Valproated, it's much more. In fact, the French government has put aside one million euros to support Valproate victims. And so we think for very modest sums, for these three schemes, they should be available for people to get support outside the present social support system. We're still working on that one. And, oh, by the way, we're also working on the redress system. Uh, the Health Select Committee have just recommended that we should change in this country to a you no-blame know, system, which we call rapid resolution and redress. So we're still hoping that will happen. We're still hoping for will happen. Five, a network of, network of special centres. Well, this uh, is part of what's known as the pause. So I will just mention the pause and then come back to it. In 2002, NICE recommended that a database should be created for everybody who had mesh inserted into their body. And it didn't happen. And other committees recommended it, and it didn't happen. And so, in, one was in 2017, just before we started. So, in 2018, 19, 18, we said, well, when we found out about this, and we were going around the country giving these stories, we said, well, surely we shouldn't be a go on doing these operations. So, we went to see the chief medical officer, and, uh, and then we went to see the government, and they said, we said, Surely we should pause it, we should stop the operations now until we put right the things which we think need to be put right. And they agreed to do that. Now, the first one uh, is that surgeons should be properly trained and to do these operations. And a lot of work has been done on that, and, and, uh, and that's actually happening. They should report every operation to a national database. Now, 
they're working on this, but it still hasn't happened. And this was agreed with Mr. Hancock just before the, the November 19th general election. And what we said is we just need a data list. We don't need a register in this case. What we need is to record every operation, who's the surgeon, who's the patient, uh, barcode the device, and create a database. Because you can always then interrogate the database. That then leads to a registry, but the registry is going to be much more than that. Because a registry measures outcomes, patient-related outcomes, not doctor-related outcomes, patient-related outcomes, and patient experience. And that requires information from patients. And for mesh, that never ever happened. The health database is anonymous and has proved uh, inefficient to find that information. We do not, we know something like 100,000 women have, many women, mesh inserted for uh, urinary incontinence. But we don't know the outcomes because we haven't been able to trace them because there is no registry. We think between 4 to 9% of women have suffered long term serious complications, but we don't know. But if we had a database, and then it would find you, which you get automatically. But if you need more personal information, that's in a registry. The patients have to give permission for that, which is why it has to be the database first and the registry second. Well, I used to look after children with kidney failure. And so we started in 1972 transplanting small children, babies. We had to work out how to do dialysis and how to transplant them. We had to do all sorts of things. So my life was involved in innovation at that time. But every child who has been treated since 1972 in this country is on a registry with their enthusiastic permission. So we know what's come, what the outcomes are, not just for the child, but for the family, the psychosocial problems and so forth. Outcomes are the essence of medical research. And so we need that. And we haven't yet got it. But there are registers coming along. The bone and joint registry is very good. It's actually one which the surgeon, the orthopedic surgeons, and the industry have devised themselves. And it's 100%, uh, which is good. But the, the, there are not many of those. The national database, by the way, was mandated by man. So if it's up and running, it should be uh, universal. Oh, there's a way of doing this, I, I should mention, it's called Scan for Safety, which does work where you scan the device, a barcode, uh, before you insert it. Uh, MHRA have mentioned that they, that they're working really hard on this and improving uh, their relationship with patients all the time. The specialist centres have been established, there are nine of them, one of them in Bristol, by the way. Well, we don't think about Bristol, I should mention. I told you that uh, childbirth is not as good in this country as in Sweden. But it is in one place in the United Kingdom. It's just up the road at Southmead. Southmead is brilliant for this. Uh, and in learning when things go wrong. And in culture uh, between the teams looking after patients. I should mention that. Uh, anyhow, uh, we do have nine specialist centres established. They're not sort of up and running. And I think there are still questions about the expertise that they'll need to develop in them because sadly some patients have had to go abroad to get a surgery, but we hope we will have nine specialist centres where we're going to develop that expertise and we'll also have a focus for the multidisciplinary teams for mesh surgery in the future. But there are sadly still some people who do need mesh. And it is the case that many patients who do have mesh do benefit from it, as we've already heard this morning. And the final one, NICE guidelines, they've been published, thank you, NICE. So we're not at the end of the course yet. So uh, back to uh, the uh, next recommendation, the database I mentioned. Now, the next one was the GMC to expand their register to include financial and non-financial interests. As we went around the country, a lot of people said to us, they were concerned that uh, doctors and surgeons were being paid uh, to put mesh in, or they weren't being entirely open 
about why they were doing it, and they had some financial benefit from it. This is not a new thing, by the way. The GMC, when I was on it, was very strict about these sort of things. Uh, but it, it, it's an international problem. And uh, uh, so, so we say, well, surely there should be a register uh, of <coughs> interest, both the manufacturers, which came over a couple of million questions. The government accepted that. That is in, in America, they have the sunshine paying that. That's going to happen. But what they haven't accepted, or the GMC haven't accepted, is that there should be a register which is available for patients to interrogate about the doctor's uh, interests, non clinical interests. Now, I can understand why the GMC doesn't want to do this, because it's actually much better done by the employer than the public and private sector. Uh, but the patients must have access to it. And it's really important that the General Medical Council, as the regulator, uh, quality assures the process. Because doctors now have annual appraisal. The appraisal process has to be overseen, I think, by the General Medical Council, and we're working to encourage them to make sure it does, and in fact, uh, oversee it so that they will then oversee the register, but not be responsible for it. So we're still working on that. Finally, uh, the task force um, to implement it. But I think it wasn't accepted, but um, <coughs> we. Uh, we are a sort of task force, and there's a parliamentary health group that's doing no that harm. We mentioned, we mentioned the MESH group. Uh, and so through that process, we're still, still working on this. So online recommendations do provide, we think, a set of measures that uh, should improve the lives of people being harmed and reduce the risk of it happening in the future. The report is 267 pages long. But the first two chapters contain the essence of it. It is available online, and uh, as I said, I don't expect to read 267 pages, but uh, reading the first two chapters might be useful. Now to consent. In the 1950s, when it was first drawn to people's attention or to the Medicines Committee, that Primadoff might cause development antibodies in babies, the committee said, but we mustn't tell the patients because they're going to worry about it. When I was a medical student, I was not allowed to use the word cancer on the wall because that was unprofessional. The patients, George the Sixth probably didn't know about cancer because it would have been immoral, unethical rather, to tell it. And that was the world where you felt it was your responsibility, doctor, not to worry patients. Of course, that is completely changed, and rightly has changed. But that is where we've sort of come from. And a landmark ruling by the uh, appeal court in 2015 set out again what should be the standard, and it's Montgomery versus Lavinger. And it says it's the patient's right to be told whatever they need to know, and in a manner that they can understand it. And that patient decision aids are an important part of that, as we've already heard. That, uh, it, uh, and with the, the mesh work, the best aids, uh, as I'll show in the next slide, we think were produced in Scotland, where they actually would sat down with the patients to work out what the aid patient aid information ought to be. And then they tested it in a controlled trial to find out sorry, if, if the patients, uh, if, if it really worked. And I think that's a very good way of doing it. Uh, how you give the information, how you record the information, I'm not sure I know uh, the answer to this. I, it was my practice when I was working, which was, as I said, retired at the end of 2000. I always copied uh, everything I wrote uh, to the doctors and patients. In fact, now you write, you were involved in the introduction of that. So, you, so the patient always got the, the letter that was going to the doctor. Uh, but the letter just contained what we'd already discussed with the patient, so that becomes a the record. But people have talked about video uh, consultations and so forth. I used to be on the editorial board of the Journal of Medical, Medical Association, and I remember one editorial saying, times have changed, the patient is the pilot, 
the doctor is the medical. And I think that sort of sums it up. The GOC guidance has changed in this respect, and, uh, and so what I'm saying uh, is now the way doctors are regulated and NICE have produced their own patient decision aid over certain <coughs> conflicts. I think that's all I've got to say.